I guess I'll just start by just explaining a little bit about my experience with electro forming. Um, when I, well, I was a flame worker, a marble maker for quite a few years, got kind of bored with marble making, uninspired in the way that I felt it becoming more and more challenging to decorate what I would consider the backside of a marble. I was a vortex guy. So I put all my energy into designing these vortexes and then I'd be like, okay, what do I do with the rest of it? So I do dots and rakes and pinwheels. And then I tried to just freestyle stuff and I was never like satisfied with it. And so I sort of started to, I guess, fall out of love with, with glass blowing. And then it dawned on me, I saw, I worked at France Art Glass and I saw people starting to electroform on beads a lot. And I thought, okay, this could be cool for glass. And so then I, I put, I bought this little startup kit and I applied copper to the backside of a marble. And it was like instantly, I was like, oh, this is really cool, metal on boro. Um, and it seemed like such a good fit that I was like, okay, this is it. And there was, I'm also into like the learning curve of new equipment and all this. So it started to like stimulate that creativity in me. Well, at that time I didn't have access to a sandblaster. And so it was, I was building outward from the marble. So I was like, okay, I don't wanna just paint smooth copper onto glass. That got boring really fast. So I started to put vinyl stickers. I would use actual, I would go to a trade show or something and end up with all these stickers, come home and I'd be like, okay. And I'd cut little shapes out and stick them onto the, the marble and paint over them. And so that's an option for people is you can actually put like anything that, that acid won't sort of eat really fast. Like vinyl is really good for that. Anything plastic you can stick on there to put some design work and then you can paint over it and you can turn that into copper by electroforming. So that kind of satisfied me for a while. And then I started gluing little, seems so shameless like now in retrospect, but like, like self, I found cell phone bling, little sticker, fake um, rhinestones and stuff. But once they're electroform, they look like little rivet heads to me. And then you can buy, a lot of jewelers use half round wire wax. So I would start putting little wax, you know, textures and gluing rhinestones and cutting little, uh, shapes out of vinyl stickers. And so everything was going outwards and then I would paint it and electroform it. And then that was for probably a couple years. And then I started to kind of lose interest again. And I had a lot of ideas in my mind. I started seeing other people in the Boro scene starting to do a lot of sandblasting. And it was dawning on me that if I could carve into the glass, I could get a lot more intricate with everything and, and sort of explore some new stuff. Because here's the deal, like the copper doesn't bond to the surface of the glass. If you electroform copper onto glass and it's not going either around the widest point or have an undercut to hold on to, it will just pop right off. So when I was <clears throat> when I was going on smooth glass or unsandblasted glass, I had to be really careful. And almost, it, it pretty much dictated that I had to almost cover up the whole backside past the widest point of the marble. Otherwise, there'd be failure. Well, it started to dawn on me that if I could sandblast a channel, I could start to do smaller designs and potentially put undercuts on that glass. And so, so anyways, I, I invested in a sandblaster and started doing a lot of hand cut vinyl. And uh, it was like, that was a big step forward because I already understood how all the, the electroforming gear worked and all of that. But what I discovered instantly was that painting the copper conductive paint onto sandblasted glass and electroforming onto sandblasted glass is not only much, much easier, but you get a much, much better coating of copper. And it like also, like the engineering behind it, it, it bonds to the glass much better too. So there's all of these like really good reasons to go further with that. So then after hand cutting um, stencils for, for six months or a year about, I finally invested in a plotter to help me cutting out my designs. I figured that having a plotter to help me cut out some of my designs would speed things up. It did not speed things up, it actually slowed things down because then I had much more design elements to work with but it did allow me to make things massively more detailed. And that also was a, a leveling up of my work. So, so that's basically what I do is I, I electroform on small marbles and I utilize a, a vinyl cutter or a plotter for my, my sand carving or my sand blasting. And then I, I do copper electroforming. So this is, this is basically the stuff I use 
except for I don't, don't, of course, have my plotter here, and I don't have my sand blaster here. Um, a lot of the, this is a lot of the vinyl that I use. Like, a lot of my designs start out as just like, you know, circles, random stars, power buttons. It's kind of hard to see. Triangles, just like, you know, I will just find random shapes. I will. I've kind of figured out the scale of things that if I want to hand draw something, I can draw it with a Sharpie and scan it into my computer and use my Photoshop to make it black and white, and then I can print it off of my plotter. So, um, so that's what I have to offer you guys is the information on how to to have like a small setup, and uh, once you get like twice to twice this size you start to require a larger power supply. And then also there's a lot more issues with the bath as well as far as getting everything to run smoothly. Like you kind of have to go into agitation, which is where the little air bubbles are blowing in the, in the electroforming solution. You have to uh, monitor your temperatures. You, lots of them have like an ongoing filtration system where it's constantly filtering the solution. We don't need any of that with this setup. Okay. So what I am going to do today is I'm going to um, explain the whole process in detail, but we're also we're going to get this marble started um, in the electroforming bath and going. Uh, does any of you guys have like electroforming setups already that you're kind of looking for extra information on how to get it to work? You and you. Okay, so I will be around all week if you have like specifics. Um, I know some people just want to take the mystery out of how this whole thing works, and then some people want to kind of learn it all, and then other people have like problems to solve. So I'll kind of run through the whole spiel, and if I don't answer your question, you can chime in or also hit me up anytime. I'll be able to paint this in front of you guys to show you exactly how I apply the paint and how I trim it out, but I was going to get the first coat done because I have I usually do two coats and then it takes at home it usually takes about 15 minutes to dry room temperature in the house. Well, when I did the first coating of this earlier today, it took like almost 40 minutes for that first coat to dry and then I realized it wasn't there it wasn't going to be a good idea to do that because we would have to wait 40 minutes before we even get the bath running. So, um so what I've done with this marble is I have put basically a band on it. You see that there is overpainting on it. And um, so let me see, how do I explain this? I'll back up a little bit here. So the, 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 and you guys can feel free to come around anyway. You can stand by the table too if you want. Um, so the basic way that this works is that I've put copper conductive paint on a piece of glass. This is going to be suspended in the middle of this bath. I use a marble, a marble stand that's epoxied to the bottom of a Rubbermaid Tupperware. Um, that was a big solution. A lot of bead makers, a lot of other people, they will actually attach a wire to the piece and dangle it. That wasn't working for uh, marbles for me, so I decided to let it just set by its own weight at the bottom of the bath. And so <laughs> that's going to set in there. Solution, this electroforming solution is going to fill up to about here, and then we're going to dangle these copper bars, which are the anodes, onto here and here. And these, these two pieces are not connected together. And then we're going to use this power supply, and we're going to, this is going to allow us to control the amps that run through. And we're going to run a positive power through the anodes and a negative to the diode, which is the marble. And I'm going to set up a wire to reach down and touch that copper conductive paint. Off of the anode? There's the, off of the, this would be the diode, which was going to be the negative. And then, so, you know, I'm not the guy who understands this on a completely scientific level, so I'm probably explaining this slightly wrong. But the basics of it is, this is like a... Uh, this can, um, this is an acid base that also helps conduct the electricity. And what's happening is, is there's like salt molecules in here that want 
to when when electricity when electricity flows through here, it wants to bond with a copper molecule. So what happens is when we turn on the power, the salt molecule comes over to the copper bar and it connects with the copper molecule. As soon as it makes that connection, it changes on a molecular uh, whatever to where then it automatically wants to ground itself. So it then works its way right to that copper paint because it's trying to ground out through the ground wire. And then it hits. And as soon as it hits, that copper molecule bonds to that copper conductive paint. And then that little salt molecule goes right on back. Well, since this is acid based, it helps break down the copper faster and it helps that whole thing happen. So to maintain your bath and to really control it, there's like the variables of like your solution and how new is it, how clean is it, are you maintaining it well. There's the temperature of it all. Electroforming likes to be around like 80 to 90 degrees. It's really happy. So like on days like today, it goes a lot slower. I have a, um, a, a heated standing mat that I use because it's waterproof. It's really handy for keeping these a little bit warmer and keeping them happy all year long. Also, there's uh, those uh, waterproof mats for like uh, gardeners for starting little plants and stuff, and those work well. So um, the other variable is just like all the copper you're using. There's the, the amount of juice you're giving it as far as the power, and then the quality of your copper conductive paint. Um, so with this piece, I have painted the whole sandblasted band. There was some overpaint, but then I took a razor knife, my X-Acto knife, and I scraped away the paint where I didn't want it to go past to trim out that band. So the circuit is sort of like broken, right? Okay. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna ensure that the copper accumulates on that band, but not any of the extra, okay? So when after I run this for like, you know, a day or so, and then I go to rinse it, yeah, this is the band where we're gonna accumulate the copper and this other stuff is going to just get washed off eventually. I've learned that after running these for about a day and you get a nice, a, a pretty thick coat of copper, then when I'm rinsing off the piece, because I, this is gonna take, this piece would usually take me about two and a half to three days of electro forming for it to be finished because my style is to go very slow. I, the, I, I've figured out how to work this machine, which I'll explain to y'all. Um, how to go very slow and get consistent results, but I, I like smooth, strong coatings. Some people like to grow nodules and have striations and all of that, and that's cool too. That happens when you are more aggressive with your power settings and all this, but, but I kind of do it the, the slow, boring way, but I like the, the results. So, um, so yeah, so it would run for about a day, and then usually in the evening when I'm shutting down the gear, I'll pull this off and I'll rinse it off. But when I rinse it off, I'll hit it with a toothbrush. And then when I hit it with a toothbrush, all this excess paint washes away. And then usually by day two, you know, it's a little more stubborn in the, in the sandblasted areas where I want it to remove. And if that's the case, I'll dip my toothbrush in a little bit of uh, uh, isopropyl alcohol, and then that'll take it right out. So um, I'm just real patient with it and go, go slow. Um, so I guess I'll start from the beginning with my, um, my carving because I, I wouldn't want anybody to say like, oh, I shouldn't electroform be on glass because I don't have a sandblaster. Like you, you totally should and you can, but I will just say straight up, like if you can, even if you're not carving details into your work, if you can electroform onto a sandblasted surface, that paint is going to apply so much better and the end result, it, it's so much easier and better. Okay, and I'll explain a little bit more why when I, when I show you how. Okay, it, it's like porous, so the paint like, the, and I'll, I'll show you my technique and it will make a lot of sense when I do. It's, it's, it's your bath, I, I, I built my bath out of way from scratch. Is that got two brighter in it? Yes. Yes. This, this is fully loaded. And I get my solution through Rio Grande, which is a, a jeweler supply store. 
and they have everything you'd ever need for uh, electroforming. I only buy my brightener and my solution through Rio Grande. I buy my, my power supplies just off Amazon. But um, you can get like the bright version or the non-bright version. I always get the bright. And after I um, run my bath for a few pieces, I do filter it and supplement the brightener and the water, which I'll talk toward, about towards the end. Um, so I won't get too much into my thought process on design with my work um, because that's a whole different thing. But like the engineering behind this, I still, on, on a marble, I still need to go mostly around a piece it, to, to, to really trust it holding on. I can, I can sandblast at an angle and you know, create sort of undercuts for it to grab onto, which is gonna ensure that that copper is gonna not fail on me and remove from the glass in the future. But, but if I was going to um, have a little, a little piece of copper design come up and then just dead end, I make sure it doesn't come too far away from anything that's really secure on the piece. And um, you know, my, my, my suggestion to everybody who is just getting started with it and also, you know, if, if you're getting started and you're not sandblasting, I would say don't even try to make little pieces that go out and do a dead end. You're just gonna get frustrated and you're gonna build it up super thick and then you're gonna be like trying to polish and clean up your marble one day and that copper is just gonna bend over. Um, I, I recommend you to go over the widest point and all the, if not all the way around a piece, pretty much all, you know, really close to all the way around. But once you start sandblasting in to, to give yourself little channels to, to paint in, you can start to be a little more um, brave with, with how far you go out and have dead ends and all that, if that makes sense. With a lot of my designs, you will see that there's, you know, the, the crisscrossing, I, I'll, I'll put like my first line on because that's where I want it design-wise. And then I'll ask myself like structurally, what do I need to do to make everything a little more safe? And then, um, you know, work from there, if that makes sense. But uh, so I decide where I want the copper. And then I, you know, I have these vinyl stickers and I use my razor knife, my, my X-Acto knife, and I will pick one little sticker off and I will apply one sticker on and one, you know, so it's a real slow process. I have different size lines, which really help. And I will apply all my vinyl stickers first. Um, vinyl really likes warm room temperature. So I used to do it out in my shop where I do my flame working. And then in the winter time, I was having a lot more struggle putting bigger stickers on that sphere surface because the surface of a sphere is really complicated to put big pieces of design on. So then once I started doing it in the house, things got a lot easier. Also, things got a lot easier when I started making sure my hands were really clean and making sure the marble was really, really clean. So I'll cut out little squares of just blue shop towels and then I'll have my isopropyl alcohol and I will like figure out, okay, I'm gonna apply these stickers right here and I'll put a little isopropyl on that little piece and I will rub it clean. And then as I'm applying stickers there, my fingers are touching it in other places. So then when I go to move to the next spot, I'll clean it. And when I started just slowing down and making sure that surface was real clean, I had a lot less failures when it went to be time to be sandblasting that glass. So um, that's something that took me a long time to learn, but once I started doing it, things cleaned up pretty good. So then once I get the vinyl design on where I want it, then to mask the rest of the piece, I use electric tape, which is a really good resist for sandblasting. I had searched out all sorts of different electric tapes and some of them, you know, shrink more than others. Some of them leave sticky residue behind. Um, and if there's people standing back there, every, there's a lot more space over here if people wanna come in and come around, but do whatever you want. Um, so, uh, I started to get into trouble where I would do, lay most of my design down and then I would let it set overnight and then I would come back and then that electric tape would like shrink up on me and I would have to redo a lot of work. So then I bumped into this tape, which is just Scotch brand 35 electric tape. And I found this stuff to be like, not only have like the less like shrinkage, but it doesn't leave sticky residue behind, even if you leave the tape on for like a week. 
Also, the white, it coming in white color is really handy because it's a good indicator for how much you're blasting it. So like this stuff turns gray, more gray and more gray, the more you're abusing it with the sandblaster. So if you're trying to get a really consistent depth on your carve, this white tape works really great because sometimes you'll get lost at where you're at in the blaster and you can kind of look at the tonality of your tape to tell you if you've worked one spot a little more than another spot. So this tape was really good. It's like, depending on where you get it, it can be like six or seven bucks a roll, but I think it's totally worth it. Okay, so then, so I, I applied my, my vinyl stickers and then I applied my electric tape on everything else and then it's ready to go. I go into the blaster. I, I just run a Harbor Freight sandblaster, just the big red one. Um, I did a couple little modifications on it, but nothing major. My, my biggest thing that I did since I'm sandblasting small stuff is I, I put a little uh, LED, one of those lights that have the, just the metal part for like a chicken coop or something. I use that with an LED bulb and I just place it right on the glass of my sandblaster. So it's just blasting light right in and I still have plenty to see what I'm doing in there. Um, I like to run like 100 pounds of pressure in the blaster. I'm running like um, anywhere from 150 to 200 um, aluminum oxide is what I, I like the best. Um, if I go less than 150, it tends to make all the edges of the design work seem a little rougher and grittier, bumpier. Um, so I think 150 to 200 is the sweet spot going Higher than 200 is fine, except for you're just going to be working longer trying to get any depth if you want depth. Okay, so then I sandblasted the piece. What I do next is I go and I just put it in a little Tupperware thing of warm water and I'll just wait five minutes. All the vinyl stickers get a lot easier to remove after about five minutes of soaking in the warm water. You might be like excited and want to pick them off, but you're going to work a lot harder picking them off uh, dry or whatever, that if you just let them soak for a few minutes. With some designs, I find myself having to actually use a razor knife, my, my X-Acto knife, to, um, which I have around here somewhere, um, to remove the stickers, but you do have to be really careful. You, we all know how wet glass can score a lot easier than dry glass. So um, you really have to pay attention to the angle because you can totally mar the surface of a marble with with the tip of a, a razor knife. Um, so I remove all the stickers, wash it in warm soapy water, let it dry well. Then we're to this stage, pre-paint. I use this paint. I've, I used to make my own paints. Um, when I made my own paints, it was a lacquer base. And then I tried some like Caswell brands and a couple others. And then I finally tried out Safer Solutions, which is a um, acrylic, so it's water-based. Uh, I'm not sure where it's made. There's only one U.S. supplier. If you, you can't buy it in any stores. I don't think they wholesale or anything. You got to go directly to them. It, you go to their website and it looks all antiquated and you're like, I'm not sure if I want to put in my information. I think actually they only take PayPal or something, but anyways, Safer Solutions. Um, I have found it to be the best um, compared to everything else. So other, other brands that I would use and the stuff I'd make myself, I found myself electroforming for like four hours, pulling it out of the bath, inspecting it, finding little patches I need to touch up, then running it again. Um, when I started going safer solutions, I'm like, it's very rare now that I have to have a little like repair on it. So um, I also, because you'll see where, the way they have their price points, they really try to entice you to buy the bigger ones because I think like a full, this is a four ounce, they sell it in like two ounces. And like, I forget the pricing, but you'll see the difference between like a four ounce and an eight ounce. You're like, whoa, I could get three times as much for only double the price. But the problem is, is this stuff does dry out. And I do a lot of electro forming and I still have yet to get to the bottom of one of these before it dries out and then you, you supplement it with some distilled water and then things get funky and then pretty soon you're like, this paint is just getting weird on me and then you end up buying new stuff and throwing away the old stuff. Um, so I would suggest just buy a small. Um, so my technique for brushing has evolved to a lot through the years. 
And, you know, I really struggled when I was doing just marbles that weren't sandblasted because of that smooth surface. A lot of times, you know, well, for one, one coat isn't enough. So you try to get one good coat and you, you brush it on pretty heavy and then you let it dry and then you're brushing on the second coat. And as you're brushing on the second coat, some of the first coat is like smearing off. And um, so you get it the best you can. You electroform it for a while and then you do touch-ups and basically you end up with these coatings that have a lot more texture on them. Um, if you're not sandblasting and you're wanting to electroform, you still should do it and try it. Just know that when you get that porous surface of the blasted glass, you're gonna be able to get a much, much smoother coating with the paint. And so what I do is, you know, shake it up really well I'll hold on to the piece. I just have a cheap little paintbrush, you know, just like you would think. I dip it and I paint it on, and I paint it on kind of heavy. I don't try to do all this overpainting. This, all this overpainting doesn't happen when I'm applying the wet coating. I get one good coating on there, set this, you know, set this down, set this down, put the cap back on this. I always put the electric tape right back on it, even if I'm gonna do another coat in 10 minutes. It prolongs the life of your solution or your paint for a long time. Set that off to the side. About that time, it's like a minute has went by. So then I pick this up and I go to my next paintbrush, which is a big fluffy brush that I try to keep pretty dry. And then I will start to sort of dab a few. I hit all these different angles and then I will brush off the excess. So what I'm doing is I'm removing the excess, but I'm also removing brush strokes and I'm smoothing out that, that layer of paint because it's going into all of the little porous surfaces, but all the extra stuff is sort of brushing off the side and either coming off with this brush or moving up onto that smooth glass. So I'm really just trying to remove paint, remove brush strokes and let every, you know, and get into all those little edges where there might be more paint accumulated, kind of stacking up. So then I put that brush off to the side and then I have a third brush. This third brush is a little more firm and really dry. So then I go, and I'm, at this point, I'm not really removing, so I don't have to go back to my, my towel. I'm pretty much like drying it and burnishing it, kind of like a wet burnish. And at this point, you get just what you see here. Like, it's not a thick coat. It's no thicker than it, need, than it needs to be to just cover everything. Everything that's excess is kind of moved away and removed. And uh, this is like, it doesn't seem like much, but that just using those multiple brushes was the difference between my work looking a little painted and chunky to being like super smooth. And when I started doing that, that's when I also started to get uh, other people commenting that, wow, your work has really started to clean up. Like what's going on? There is a sweet spot for trimming out the, the borders of that paint. Like you might think like, oh, I'll let it dry overnight, which you totally can do and it's gonna not harm anything, but that paint is gonna get like a lot more hard. It's gonna harden and it's gonna be more difficult to carve away. If you wait like 15 minutes to a half hour, that paint is still soft enough that it's gonna carve away really easily. And it's going to um, also, you can get it to like, instead of, flaking off in little powdery chunks, you can get it to like kind of, kind of like you'd expect with a wettish paint, sort of like peel off big strips, which makes it a lot less messy to clean up. So what that looks like when I do that is me holding on to the piece, me taking a, a, a nice blade. I, you know, you can either buy with, when it comes to X-Acto blades, you can either like go to the hardware store and buy X-Acto brand and get like really high quality blades, but you're gonna pay a lot for them or you can go to like Amazon and get a hundred pack of the same types of blades for like dirt cheap. Well, the problem is, is they're gonna get dull a lot faster, but you're not trying to like do a whole lot of cutting with these anyways. You're, you're really using the tip and just the top of the edge. So I think of them as throwaway. So like a lot of times when I go to trim out the paint, I'll just throw a new blade on, but I'm also conscious that like these new blades are covered in oil. So I'll like, you know, pick it out of the, the little container and I'll wipe it off really good and put it on here and, you know, make sure my hands are clean. But so then what's cool about car trimming these out is it's really easy because you sort of carve down into the glass. So the smooth glass is up a little higher. 
and it gives a really good surface. So I just get this nice and level with that edge and you can just watch it scrape right up to it. And I'll do a little bit of scraping. I usually hold this over the garbage can. If you wanted to be really health you know, conscious, a, a dust mask is always a great idea. And then I'll just, you know, not let the, that powder get everywhere. And I, I definitely don't do this over my workstation either because then I have had like a sort of like a contamination issue in the past where if a bunch of little copper flakes get everywhere and you set it down, it will stick onto a spot you don't intend and it will turn into uh, something that you don't want. So I'm just doing like an inch of carving away and then I'm um, taking my dry brush and, and I just trim out the whole thing. And so that's at that point where to where um, you, uh, you're basically disconnecting that circuit from any of that overpainted stuff. And that's going to make the copper accumulate where we want it. OK. So after that, I will make sure it's really dry and um, prepare my bath. So like I said earlier, this is just a, a Rubbermaid um, bath or, you know, container from Walmart or wherever. And this size is really nice for doing small pendants and um, small to medium sized marbles. And um, you can even do like some small functional stuff. Uh, I also have a couple sizes that are a little bit bigger. Um, this copper pipe is just copper pipe from the hardware store, uh, which I did a little research because I thought, oh, maybe it's not the best quality, but it's actually completely ideal for electroforming. Um, so there's like two main types of copper. There's phosphorized and non-phosphorized. Copper pipe is phosphorized. Phosphorized is just they do an extra stage when they're melting down copper through the refinement. And the benefits of phosphorized copper is, although it's less conductive for electricity, it's, it's, uh, or it's, yeah, it's less conductive, but it's higher resistant to, um, to uh, deteriorating. Um, and then you have your non-phosphorized, which is like your electrical wires, and that's higher conductive or corrosive was the word I'm, I'm looking for. So it's less corrosive. Um, phosphorized copper, when you're electroforming with it, it develops a black film over it. And that's why I was starting to question if it was the right stuff, because I thought it was kind of getting my bath dirty. Because if I electroformed all day, there would be this black film over the bar. Well, I got online and I did some research and there's been some really in-depth studies about it. And what they discovered was phosphorized is actually really great because that black film does not act as a resistant at all to the copper, the clean copper uh, molecules coming through. It does, however, act as a barrier and hold on any of the impure copper particles that are on there. If you use, if you use non-phosphorized, which you can find out there, um, it won't develop that black film, but what will be happening is little particles of copper that's not conductive will be dropping to the bottom of your bath. And so it will be schmutzing up your bath much quicker. And so that, that black film you get on these bars, um, it can foul your solution in the way of if you let it get really, really thick and then you start banging stuff around and you'll see it start flaking off. Well, what I've discovered is if I maintain this on a daily basis, where I'll run it for like 12, 14, 15 hours, but then ultimately at the end of the day, I remove the bars from the bath, I remove the marble from the bath, then it's not accumulated so much that it wants to flake off yet. So it's as simple as me removing these bars at the end of the day, putting them in uh, another container of warm water and letting it set overnight. And then by morning, it's all kind of off there anyways. There's no scrubbing, really. You can take a towel and just do that, and anything extra comes right off. And so I've discovered by doing that, it has made it much easier to clean my solution and maintain good solution. Um, the wire that I'm using here for my bars, or from 
te technically, if you were gonna, you know, this is this is tube or pipe. They refer to these as bars. Anything that holds your anode, uh, uh, they they the technical term within electroforming would be bars. But so this is just from the hardware store too, and this is just grounding wire, just standard. You can get it by the foot, and um, you only need like three feet to put together one of these small baths. Um, and you know, pretty simple to bend it, pretty simple to cut it. With this copper tube or pipe, it's actually really easy to cut too. There's just a simple little tool you can buy. I think it costs like six or seven bucks. And it's a little tool that has two little cutter wheels and almost looks like a scoring tool. And you, it has this one little knob on it and you just get it to, to fit on there just where you want it. And you just cinch that knob down just a little bit and then you rotate it around and it puts a, a thin cut in it and then you just turn that knob one more time and one time around and one more, it does take zero muscle and then the, pot, the pipe just goes pop and you've got your pipe. Drilling it, however, can be more complicated. I have a little drill press and wear gloves and you know eye protection and just do it that way. The benefit of this is that these last a really long time. Like copper is removing from this and working its way to your piece. And this is getting thinner and thinner and it gets so thin that it's like, you'll start to see holes in it and it's time for new copper pipe at that point. If you were to put all the work into cutting some pop, uh, some pipe and, some, and drilling it, my suggestion is just like buy yourself a nice long piece, figure out the right depth and just batch it out. Like make yourself, you know, 10 of them or something, and you'll be good to go for a year for one bath. So um, it's kind of a pain, but w when you get it done, it, it lasts a long, long time. Uh, the wire I've been using lately for my, to attach my bar to my marble uh, has just been recycled wire. This is like literally wire that's in something like this. So I, you can salvage it. I really enjoyed, I, I had bought a ballast that um, had to replace a ballast in the, the fluorescent light in my kitchen and it came with ridiculously long wires that was a smaller gauge than this and I really enjoyed using that. Before I was salvaging it, um, I was using eight gauge that you can get at the hardware store on a little spool. You'll just figure, you'll see that there's wire like this out everywhere in the world and people just give it to you and it will last forever as to where the, the eight gauge you buy in a spool will be pretty expensive. So. Um, on that note, talking about salvaging, I want to tell you guys just a little story about um, when I first got involved with, with electroforming and I was selling some stuff at a local, uh, a local market close to my house. It was kind of like a, a kind of a rich neighborhood and uh, it was actually at a place where most people arrive on sailboats and such. Anyways, there was an old historical house there and they were remodeling it and they were gonna throw away the old original copper plumbing. And I snagged a piece of it and I, I used it for electroforming on some pieces and then I went and showed this work at this market. And what I found out that people were really intrigued that it was salvaged from, they called it the McCreevy house. And I'm like, this is McCreevy house copper. And I explained to him and people were like, that sold a lot of the pieces to these people because they thought they were like grabbing a piece of their local history. So, you know, that's something to pay attention to if you can use, you know, copper from around your area and work it into a story of the piece um, that is a selling point and uh, very valid, so. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do to set this bath up is I'm gonna size up this wire to the piece. And what I'm going for, first of all, is to set this marble in the stand in a way that the stand itself isn't covering up anything I want to conduct the copper to. So if, if, if I happen to have it at a steeper angle and it was covering up any of that conductive paint, it will not conduct there and you will see that spot. And I have made that mistake. So, these clippers, I don't know what the technical term for them are, but you can find these at any little hardware store too. For trimming the ends of copper wire, these are like extra awesome because you kind of want to contour the um, bottom of the wire with the surface of the, the marble or the piece of glass. So if I'm at this angle, I don't necessarily want this to be perfectly uh, squared up. So, and I don't want it to be jagged either. So 
I'm just gonna carve away a little bit and get a subtle angle there. Then what I do is I put my bar right over the top and then I kind of figure out where it would be touching down and then I give myself an extra inch and a half to two inches. I wanna be able to wrap it around this bar a couple times. So then I just set it down in there, leaving myself a little extra and then I wrap it around a couple times. And what I'm going for is by its own weight, I want it to set without being too wibbly wobbly. So that's a little long, <laughs> close, but I left it a little long because now I get to really inspect that in. I, actually, I did really good on getting that angle aimed the right way. I'll shorten it up a bit. I want it to be tight on this bar. Like I don't want it really loosey goosey. All right. Still a, just a hair short. It's a little adjustment. Right in there is pretty good. Um, the thing is, is I want to leave myself a little extra length because I will be changing the point of contact. Something to understand with flame work or with uh, electroforming is that, so the copper that accumulates on this piece, it's going to find the path of least resistance. It's going to, sh it's going to find the shortest path. So what you have is you have this paint on this piece. It's not rigid yet. It's actually really soft. You can scratch it, peel it off. So this is a concern of ours in a couple ways. And this is also, let me point out one more difference of painting on smooth glass versus surface or uh, the frosted glass. Frosted glass, it's kind of like gripping on, right? So the paint doesn't really, as a sh as, imagine it as a sheet of paint over the top of something. If it's on smooth glass, it can kind of move a little bit still. It can kind of slide on there. So if I attach a wire to it and I crank it, the first thing it's gonna do is kind of crinkle just a little bit and it's gonna create these little lines, these striations going right bullseye to that contact point. But what you just did is you just created, even though it might just at first be the slightest hair, you created these little high points. And then those high points are gonna get larger and larger and larger. I mean, you can see this sometimes on people's work uh, I see it on pictures and stuff where there's these ridges and they're really deep and almost seem sharp. And that's because they just cranked it right from the beginning on smooth glass, it kind of crinkled and those got bigger and bigger and bigger. That versus that same surface, but it's frosted, you can be much more aggressive about your, your rates without it doing that, that crinkling. So um, the other point I wanna make is that the beginning of electroforming this piece, since it is just a thin layer of paint, is that, so, so what a lot of people do is they will actually attach this wire to their piece. Uh, in traditional like bead, when you're working on a bead, they will make this wire go through the center of the bead and come back around and touch the copper. And it has that one contact point the whole time. And you, a lot of times you'll see a lot of the, the, the textures going right to that bull, the bullseye of where that was contacted and go on and on. Well, the one thing they don't have to deal with is they're not removing that contact point and moving it. So they might not understand that if you're going for a smooth coating, it has everything to do with not letting that wire fuse itself to the paint. So if it's just a thin layer of paint and that, that wire's going down and touching onto it, and I turn this on and I just let it go and go and go, I'm gonna pull this up and the marble's gonna be actually attached to it. You're gonna be like, oh crap. And then you're gonna have to like cut it off and then like file it down that little spot if you're going for a smooth, a smooth surface. So, or I'm gonna try to wait like say an hour and pull it up and that paint is still pretty thin. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna pull a chunk of paint off and you're gonna see a big strip of paint on here. And then you're gonna look down and see a bald spot and be like, oh crap. So the solution is to change this point of contact many times throughout the first hour of electroforming. So what I'm gonna do when it, when it gets started is I'm gonna turn this on and I'm gonna turn it on very low at first 
and I'm gonna wait like five minutes. And then I'm gonna turn this off. I'm gonna remove my point of contact. It hasn't stuck yet, great. And I'm just gonna move it over a little bit and I'm gonna to touch it down somewhere else and I'm gonna turn it on again. I'm gonna wait five minutes. And then the next time I might wait 10 minutes. I'm gonna keep, even if I'm moving it over just a little bit. And what that's doing is not only is it not allowing that piece of wire to like fuse itself to that paint so it won't peel off, it's making it so that um, it's not creating those striations to one singular point of contact. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, I'll also say that when I started figuring out that like, oh, if I keep this point of contact right here and I run a little more aggressive and it creates those little lines, I can run this side for one full day and then I can remove it from over here and I can put it over here and then it will create striation straight for that and what you've done is you've just created like a crosshatch pattern. It almost looks like brush strokes going across each other. So you can manipulate those surface textures in really appealing ways too, if you want. Um, but like I said, now I've, I've more, my pocket is like smooth. So that's where I go. Okay, so this is looking really good to me. So now I'm gonna just remove this stuff. Typically I would mock up my, my pipe to my anodes and just make sure um, that it's a good fit. There are some rules to, to electroforming proportion wise, and the rules have to do with your anodes and your also how much power you run. If you go and search online, you can find these sort of like formulas. But what I'll say is there's like too many variables, too many factors involved where they're not consistent enough that there's other, there's other things to pay attention to to let you know if there's too much power, too little power. Anyways, one of the rules is you try to estimate what the surface area of the copper that you want to accumulate. Like this, basically, what is the square inches of this band, okay? And then the rule for the anodes is you typically want no more than two times the surface area of your copper conductive paint with your anodes. With, the reason they say that is because if you go beyond that, like if, you, if I was to put like three, three bars on each side here and you'd be like then by far exceeding double, I'm already exceeding double, but if I was to by far exceed it, I would never develop that, that coating of phosphorus. It, it pulls so much slower off those pipes that the phosphorus doesn't accumulate and it will foul your solution. So the, the sweet spot for the suggestion on the anode is that it will make your solution last longer because you'll get those better coatings of the black phosphorus slime, sledge, whatever. Um, with that being said, my go-to is two, bar, two pipes on, on, the, on each side. Uh, it just has like always worked really well for me. It's like, it's not broke, don't fix it. And if, if I was to go to a smaller marble with a smaller band, I would only run one bar on each side. Uh, you try to have these bars spaced out pretty evenly. I kind of went off these, you, you kind of wanted all to travel the same distance and all of this. If I'm running a really small marble, I might close this in a little bit. If I'm running a really big marble, I might widen it out a little bit. Anyways, that's that. So, okay, it's fitting in there. This fits in all right. A lot of times it's, it's a smart idea to actually clip your, um, clip your wires up because they do kind of tug. These are brand new wires too, so they're like really stiff. Okay, so you kind of like, the angle of which that, that banana clip is on there will, uh, tug on this in a different way and it can either work for you or against you. You kind of want to like get everything set and, set and nice before you pour this solution. Now, I used to get it mocked up just how, like I'm like, okay, good, it's perfect. Then I would like, okay, now I'm gonna dump my solution in there. Well, the problem with that is air bubbles. When I pour this solution in, it gets agitated, there's all these little bubbles they're gonna to cling to the surface of that marble. Wherever there's an air bubble attached to that copper paint, you're not gonna get copper accumulating. It can be a very cool effect if you like, I've done these ones like, 
I, I did this one marble that was like a galaxy and it looked like an old distressed, like spacey thing. And on the final day, after already having a really thick coating of copper, I put, I mocked it up like this first for the beginning of my third day. And I poured the solution in really carelessly and I, I, I trapped air bubbles on there on purpose and I let it run for a day. And then it looked like, by the time I was done patina in it, it looked like it like had little crater marks and stuff like it had been flying through space. So you can utilize that if you want, but just be aware. If you want clean, I've learned that um, the better way to do it is just to mock it up, remove it, and then pour your solution. Um, I typically try to go like an inch, inch and a half above the marble with my solution. Uh, you will want eye protection, you know, if you're really like your eyeballs. It's not gonna burn your eyeballs out instantly or anything. This stuff is not, this stuff is nasty. There's no doubt about it. But it's not nearly as nasty as the stuff for gold plating or uh, silver plating and all of that. That's a whole nother game. You gotta have much better ventilation, be w way more cautious about it. Um, this stuff, if it splashes on your clothes, you will, the next time you wash it, you'll find a nice little hole. So wear your shop clothes. Um, yeah. This stuff, it, it seems really gnarly, but it is very, very common for people to do this in their house. You know, ventilation is recommended. A lot of the reason ventilation is recommended is like right now, there's all these little bubbles you guys can see. Those are the bubbles that would be clinging onto the glass right now. Um, but all those little bubbles are popping. And when those little bubbles are popping, they're sending little splashes of this stuff up in the air. And that's what you don't want to be around all the time. If you are running a bigger bath and you're agitating it with, like by actually running air bubbles through it to get the better circulation of the, of the, of the solution, then uh, your ventilation becomes much more critical. But this just kind of sets there the way I do it. Somewhere right in here is fine. I'm going to go a little more. Not really. Like, anything? what you'll notice is like with these with these pipes, I they look like they're sanded because I did sand them a little bit. But the only reason I sanded them was because when I drilled them, there was like burrs, and I wanted to deburr those because it's nothing worse than getting stabbed with a little sharp piece of metal, you know. And then so I had the. I had the, the tube and I, I had the sandpaper, so I thought, oh, I'll just clean them up a little bit. Um, so, but no, um, if you wanted to be like more meticulous, I'm sure hitting them with some, something to get any grease or oils off of it would be smart. Um, it would be smart to do that. Um, when talking about like keeping this solution happy as a glass, Working with glass, you actually have it off really easy because glass is sort of like a sterile, like a non-organic, like as opposed to like a dead leaf or a bone or you know a gem or something like that. And that when I, it, nothing from the glass leaches into the solution to make it dirty. But it, for people who are doing like, oh, I'm gonna copper plate this insect and then put it on my piece or something, then all of a sudden the acid is eating away at whatever that organic material is and it's getting into your solution. And so that's gonna make your solution foul much quicker and it's gonna be much more critical to maintain it uh, through filtration and all that. If you're just working glass, then it's, your solution is gonna last way, way longer. If you find yourself being like, well, if I'm in an electro form, I wanna do it all, maybe segregate your solution in your bath for your glass so you know this stuff is more pure, you know, and then use this other stuff, other solution for, and don't just don't mix it up or whatever, I don't know. Okay, so now that this is filled up, what I do next is I get my bars in next. It's not really smart to let your bars soak for a long, long time in the solution um, because that acid is slowly eating away at it. Um, 
like a few minutes doesn't matter, but like I'm talking about like for a day or two days or something. There's people who, if their if their bath starts um, getting old and they feel like they need to juice it up a little bit, they'll soak copper pipes. But I don't do that, so I can't really recommend. This is just normal water, and uh, just like what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this glove, which is my go-to glove for when I'm doing staining wood or whatever nasty stuff. But I'm gonna use this to pick up this marble and actually place the marble on the stand. I used to try tongs and all this sort of stuff. You end up scratching the paint. All sorts of stuff could go awry. So then um, basically what I do is I will um, pick up this marble try to place it in here very similar to how I had it mocked up, pull my, my hand out my glove, and then I, now I use these tongs to like, just help me pull my gloves off without touching it. And then I'll just put that in here. Oh, I didn't want to do that. I have a, uh, another Tupperware container this size that I actually use for my glove to put it in some water and it doesn't slide in. I use this for the logistics of getting everything over here. So it's not working the same way. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just grab this piece, set it in. It's really like, can be frustrating with small marbles. Um, I have these sort of old school acrylic marble stands that used to be readily available on eBay and places like that. So there's like small, medium, and large, and the small size actually fits into the hole of the, this large size. And that was really handy because sometimes I would want to electroform a small marble, but trying to place a small marble on this bigger stand without it covering up any of your copper work is really frustrating and complicated. So then my workaround for that was I take a small marble and put my, uh, you know, design on it as far as carving it and painting it and all of that. And then I took that small marble stand and I will, I'll put electric tape over the part of the marble that doesn't need to accumulate the copper. And then I hot glue that small marble stand right onto that electrical tape. And then I'm able to take that and put it down and then like kind of lock it into that other marble stand. So then that small marble is being held really firmly there. It's really tough to get a, a long wire with a big bar to, to touch down on a little teeny marble without knocking it off the stand and such. So anyways, if you find yourself doing the peewees, you might wanna figure out some system like that. Okay, so now I have this brush, and what I'm gonna do with it is I'm gonna brush. Oh, you just saw that, oh, that probably came from the paper brush, but so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm brushing what I can reach, what's exposed to me of where I'm gonna apply the copper to get any little air bubbles off there. And that little move makes a big difference, um, especially on day one of electroforming. I used to think it was just the standard to have to do a lot of touch-ups. But then what I realized as I got better and better and better is that you can like apply the paint once, start accumulating copper, and never have to go back and paint it again if everything falls into place, which now has become my standard. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this on now. And I'm gonna turn this up. And I'm looking at the amps up here. I'm gonna explain this a little more. I'm just gonna get this going. Now you see these volts just bounced up. I'm not gonna go any farther. All right. So I'm only going to adjust the amps. As far as the only knob I'm ever gonna to touch on this thing is the amps. What I have right now, how I have this set up is my volts is all the way up. It's, it's, it's cranked. And then my amp started all the way down and then I adjusted it up. Well, it's kind of confusing and it's especially confusing to people who have this set up at home and they read what they thought they were supposed to do and they've tried to work it in there because they look at this and they say it's not doing anything. The amps say zero. But what you might have noticed is that when I turned this on and this went to 0.1 volts instantly and then I started just by a hair turning this up, I saw this bounce from 0.1 to 0.2. 
And so I just backed it off a little bit. This is barely, barely, barely up. One thing to keep in mind is this solution is brand new. I mean, I just opened it today. So it is like juiced. And it's gonna act a lot differently on this first marble than on the second marble. What's gonna happen is after I do a marble or two with this, when I first turn it on, this isn't even gonna be at 0.1 volt. It's gonna be at zero, point zero volts. And then I'm gonna turn these amps up until this hits 0.1. And that's gonna be my indicator. But since this, this solution is so like powerful right now, this is like, I'm, I'm being very conservative here because if I can get a smooth coating to happen from the beginning, it's gonna be much easier to build on that smoothly. And so even right now, it's probably been like three minutes or three and a half minutes since I turned this on. I'm just gonna turn it off. I'm gonna lift it up. And I can, I can feel it when it starts trying to connect itself. It, it was like there was a little something there, but not dramatic. Let me go. I'm going to turn it right back on and I'm just going to look. So this is the safe zone. This is the part that confuses people because you, if you look in here, it's not doing anything. It does not look like anything, but I know that it's working. Now, what's going to happen, maybe, uh, it, it, it's always a wild card with the very first solution batch because it's so fresh, is that as copper accumulates, this 0.1 should drop down to 0.0. And then I know to turn it up till it turns 0.1. Eventually this is gonna turn up to like 0.01 amps, 0.02 amps. Now, if you like looked it up on the computer, like how many amps to run for, for a certain size you know, piece that you're doing. They would say, take the square inches of surface that you're trying to electroform and do 0.10 amp per square inch. Well, if I guesstimated that this was, you know, say even two and a half square inches, and I put that up to 0.25, that would be growing that copper so fast. And that's why people, I'll see them online all the time with like this, all noduled out, crusty looking stuff. And they'll be like, what's happening? I'm doing what it told me to do. And it's because especially with new solution and all this, it just, it, it's just not right for what we're doing. And there was a big breakthrough when I started like, um, you know, watching the machine differently and reacting to the machine differently. So um, now the way I look at that 0.20 amps per square inch is as a guideline that if on the final day when I have a lot of copper accumulated and I'm able to turn that, turn these amps up 2.25 and this doesn't bounce, want to bounce up to 0.2 volts, that's telling me like my solution is getting really dirty. That's telling me that there's like some resistance in there happening that's just not, because I never have to really push the ceiling of those, those rates. And I know this seems like, like alien language or something if you haven't like kind of already been through all of this. But um, it really has been a breakthrough for me to figure this out. And I've had many, many other people who have struggled with this, who have the equipment at home that I just kind of get them to understand that one thing and they go home and next thing you know, they're like doing these really nice clean coatings. So um, it's been a few minutes again. I'm gonna just turn it off. I'm gonna disconnect, move it over just a little bit, connect it again. Now, 0.2 volts, that's not good. That can mean two things. That could either mean that I don't have a good connection right now, or that could mean that I need to turn that of the amps down a little bit. I'm betting that I don't have a good connection right now. So at a kind of a weird angle. So I'm gonna get it going again. Okay, so I think that's a better angle. I'm gonna turn it on. 0.0. Excellent, oh, see now it's like kind of bouncing between zero and one. So that's telling me that a little bit of copper is accumulated. I have a really good connection right now. So like, I have to babysit this thing right now for the first hour and then I'll have like, I'll, for like at least every 15 minutes for the first hour, then for the second hour, every 20 minutes. After, by, the, by the time it's been going for two hours, I can start checking on it every couple hours, um, make small adjustments here and there. And once I'm not having to like really babysit it, I'm of course doing other stuff around the shop. 
so I'm at the, you know, I'm torching. I'm like, oh crap, I forgot the thing. And I'll look across and I'm really looking at these volts because if these volts are jacked up, you, something happened and you have probably disconnected. Now, if that's gotten disconnected in there, what's gonna happen is you're running really aggressive power to a little tiny piece of copper because the only part that it's being drawn to is the tip of that, that copper wire that's sticking down there. And it will start fritzing out all this stuff and it will really hose stuff up. So, um, but that's what I've learned to do is just look at what this is doing. Now that it's bouncing between, I know I can turn these amps up a little bit more now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it off just for the sake of I'm gonna do an adjustment, even though it hasn't been five minutes. I'm gonna turn it back on. And now we're back up to point one, but um, I'm still just gonna turn this up a little bit. Way too much, it's really fidgety. These are cheap machines. It's the other thing, um, see if I can get it to, there's point two, I'm gonna go down just a little bit. Okay, so there's really just not much play in there. I'm just gonna let it ride for a bit. So like this HY1803D, you're, you can put that number in, and then this is just known as a, you can be called a DC power supply or just a power supply. This piece of equipment is used for like bench testing, all sorts of electronics, very common tool made in China. If you put HY1803D power supply into Amazon, you're gonna find five different brands of them. They all look exactly the same. The difference is, the, the little, this one is a tech power. You're gonna find them with all sorts of little brandings on them. They're all made from the same factories. People buy them in bulk and pad print their own logos on them. This power supply probably costs around $70, okay? This solution costs probably about $35, $40 shipped um, from Rio Grande. Uh, the bath is like five bucks, like the container. The pipe is like, I mean, if you're buying your pipe in, in four foot lengths, it's gonna cost you eight bucks or less probably. The wire is less than five bucks. I mean, you're looking at less than $200 easily for everything. Um, paint brushes and everything. The co conductive paint is gonna cost you like 40 bucks. So that's one of your bigger expenses. Like I said, definitely use the, the electric tape around it. Uh, whenever it's not in use. And then if you're not gonna use it for like long periods of time, just double down and put it in a bag without any air. Um, okay, so now I'm just gonna see it jogging again. I'm, it's being real touchy because this, this solution is so new. And I've ran into this in other demonstrations because if I brought solution that was just a little bit older, you're gonna get a lot bigger adjustments out of this. Like you have to be a lot heavier handed with it to get it to do anything. But the problem I have is, is that it's like you can't ship this stuff legally without filling out a lot of paperwork. And so like you order it through Rio Grande New and they, they ship it UPS ground and they've already got everything. And so it's like, if the bottle breaks on them, it's fine. But if you ship it from your house somewhere across the country and it leaks that solution all over, you can get nailed with a big fine for it. So it's just not worth it for me. So um, it makes this stage of it, let's see if it'll let me do, this stage of it a little less exciting, but it's really the trick. Okay, so now I run it for, you know, I, I really avoid even starting a marble if I can't run it for at least eight or four hours on the first session. Usually after four hours, I get that first good shell where it can handle being taken out, taken out of the bath very carefully and rinsed off very carefully. I would never try after only four hours to take this thing out, rinse it off and hit it with my toothbrush to, to take all that excess over painting off of it because that paint or the copper is like, it's like copper foil at that point, you know? It is not rigid yet. And how, if you can imagine like a, a copper band carved into a piece, the sides of that carving is like, you know, like this. And what'll happen is the, the, the ridges on the sides will fold over and you can get them to fold back and it's all good, but it, it gets weird sometimes. So if I can't run it for like at least four hours, I don't even attempt it, which we're right on the edge of that tonight. But then um, six hours is really ideal. Eight, eight hours is even better. Um, so then what'll happen is 
I'll turn off the machine. I'll have, I'll have a container with some water and I'll just pull this out and I'll just dip it a couple times. And then I will very gently with a paper towel, dab it dry and set it off to the side. These copper pipes will be slid off the bar and just soaked in water overnight. And then I will put my lid, I have the snap on lid of this and I will just snap the lid on it, let it set there tomorrow, pull the lid off, put the pipe, just what you just saw, turn it on again and look at that power just the same. Now, after by the end of tomorrow, it will definitely have forced me to turn this power setting up a little more. And then um, it'll also, by the end of the day, it will have a much thicker coating, but it won't be done yet. Um, it, it might be done, it's hard to say uh, because of this new solution. But um, I'll pull it out tomorrow, I'll soak it in water for a second, and then I'll hit it with the toothbrush, get all that excess paint off, dab it dry, set it off to the side, and then it's highly likely that the day after tomorrow, I will again put it in the solution and run it for at least half a day, pull it out at this point, I will try to remove all the excess copper off it. If, if there's any copper paint that's left in the, the extra frosted, because there's, there's some, some carved design in this marble on the lens that I don't intend to accumulate copper in. So I'll need to clean any copper paint that might've stuck in there. So I'll use the isopropyl alcohol with, with a toothbrush. I'll also say that I have like, this is my toothbrush I use for isopropyl alcohol uh, to get the paint out. This is the one I use for just warm soapy water. It does make a difference because if you use a, a toothbrush with isopropyl alcohol a whole bunch, and then you use it for hot soapy water, you're gonna dry off that marble and you're gonna see this weird film over it. And I don't know what it is, but it's like a cross contamination sort of thing. So I do have certain toothbrushes for certain, certain jobs. So then what I'm gonna do, once the copper is fully accumulated and I'm happy with it is I'm gonna let it get, I'm gonna wash it with some warm soapy water and then I'm gonna make sure it's like bone dry. Once it's bone dry, I you know, inspect it visually, make sure everything's cool and then I inspect it by feel. Um, with copper, what you're gonna find is if you're putting copper on things, it's gonna be a tough sell if it does not feel good in hand. Like it's gotta feel, it's gotta feel nice, you know? Especially if it's a pendant or something, but marbles, you know, they're meant to be handled. So, uh, so then I let my, my hands like explore the whole thing and I, I feel for any little bumps or, or whatever. Um, sometimes there's like little tiny things that like you can just feel it a little bit. It's like slightly scratchy or if you were to wipe it down with a cloth, it would like grab a little chunk or something. I found this tool to be very handy, which what this is is like the smallest doming tool you can get, right? So it's just like a punch tool pretty much, but uh, it's for doming metals or stamping metals or whatever. It's like a Harbor Freight sort of a deal. All this is, is a hard piece of metal with a little ball on it. The reason that that tool has been so good to me is because, you know, copper is pretty soft. And so if you have any weird little um, artifacts on your copper coating, what you can do is you kind of like scribble on it. Like, you know, you grab your piece and you just like, oh, I felt something there and I'll use this little tip and I'm not using force, you know? I'm just like gently scribbling on it. And then sometimes there's like a sharp edge in there where you, where like the walls of where you carve down in that groove and you need to kind of get in a tight spot. And so this end works really good. So this just has, and then it's like with it being a rod and if you wanted to like actually work on a bigger surface, this works really well. So this is a tool that has helped me just like, you know, smooth it out, make it feel better in hand. I find myself having to use this less and less the more I understand the power and how to get a good coating in the first place. I have far less little weird, sharp, pokey things since I paint on the copper the way I do with the multiple brushes. I can't explain enough how much difference that makes in getting a nice smooth coating. Okay, so then I will, you know, have made sure it feels pretty good in hand. I may have just scribbled it with this thing, but now I want the whole surface to be like consistent because I'm gonna patina it. So then I just use a standard wire brush. It's a brass wire brush. Um, and I'm gonna hit it with a wire brush. 
I'm gonna make sure it is bone dry because like almost like I said earlier with the, the X-Acto knife, it's like if that glass is wet and you go at it with a wire brush, you are gonna scratch it. So, and you know, I try to not <laughs> wire brush it any more than I have to and I try to not use force, but I try to kind of like create a very consistent surface for if you think of it as the patina is gonna kind of soak in a little bit, I try to make sure that it's like, you know, consistent with itself really. So I just wire brush the whole thing. I do that on every single marble. Then I will patina it. I'm just sort of checking this really often because I am keep getting afraid that I'm losing track of time. In a minute, I'm gonna to try to get a little more power on here. So there's many ways to patina copper. The one that I've been enjoying the most is liver of sulfur. I used to buy liver of sulfur in big chunks, um, which is very available and cheap or inexpensive. And what I would do is I would get these little chunks and I would find like the greenest looking little chunk and I would use these special pliers and I would, I would chip off a little bit into powder. I use, this is like what the, this tape comes in but I, I like them for, you know, making the uh, liver of sulfur solution happen. Um, then somebody suggested me like, why don't you use the gel? And I had never even heard of the gel and I've tried the gel. And ever since I've tried the gel, it's like, it's so much user friendly. It's easier to control, it's consistent. So now I like the gel, you find it on uh, Amazon, super cheap. So, um, what I'll do is I'll put just a little dot of this on here and I'll get some warm tap water and I'll just put just a little bit of water in there and it will turn into this like green solution, like a light green watery solution. I'll wear my rubber gloves because when you get liver of sulfur on your hands, it smells like rotten eggs or fart, you know, and it sticks around. So uh, I use rubber gloves and then I will have another uh, uh, Tupperware container that I will put this in that Tupperware container and I'll hold the marble, you know, with gloves on and I will just take another paintbrush and I will pick up that solution and I will brush it onto that copper and I will see an instant change of the, the color of the copper. All of these marbles up here have been um, done with liver of sulfur and when I wrap this up here in a minute, I welcome you all to come up and check them up, check them out. Um, so there's an instant change. I, I, I brush it. You can kind of, if you massage it in with the paintbrush, you can watch it get darker and darker. The, the more you dilute it with water, the less dark it will be. Um, I go for really dark because my big trick is I carve details down into the glass, copper plate it, patina it heavy, and then I buff out the top and that makes the deeper design darker. And I like that it makes the detail pop out more. So, um, so I go pretty heavy with it. But what I will say is that if you brush that patina on and you think I want it really dark, so I'm gonna let it set around. If you let it dry onto it, then when you go to wash it off, it might come off in like flakes. So what I do is I brush it on and while it's still wet, I almost instantly go over to warm soapy water and I rinse it off, put a lot of soap on there. I use dish soap, I use hand soap, whatever. And I have another toothbrush for that. And I will like scrub and I'm almost, I'm like, try to scrub as much off as you can because if there's anything that's not just strictly the reaction to the copper, it's gonna stink like liver of sulfur. And you don't want stinky work. So, you know, clean it really, really well. And um, then I, I dry it off and I set it off to the side and I look at it and if it's the way I like it, which it normally is on the first try, um, I just let it dry. But if, well, I let it dry regardless. If you want it darker, just let it dry really well. Think of, think of the, the copper as like, a, 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 like it absorbs a little bit. So if you've just rinsed it off with water and it's sitting there and it's damp, it's gonna be harder to get another patina reaction out of it. So like let it be dry and then hit it again. So then once you get that patina to be, you know, as dark as you want it, the next thing that I do is I, um, I buff it out and I found these really cool little polish pads. They're just called ultra polish pads and they're for polishing brass and copper and you can find them on Amazon. And I hit that marble with this 
Well, actually, I can probably show you since some of these have been sitting around for a while. Um, so my intention with this, by the way, is that I wanna finish, I'm gonna keep this going for the next couple days. Hopefully, even when it's nobody's watching it, it doesn't get bumped and everything's cool. I'll keep checking on it. But when I think it's getting close, I'm gonna write a sign and I'm gonna put it out right here that's gonna say like, on Thursday at two o'clock, I am going to patina this marble. So if you guys are interested in the patina side of it, stay tuned, check in, and I will put a sign up, like let's say like at least a day before it happens. Mm -hmm. And then y'all can meet up here and watch it happen in real time. It's pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, I take the, these pads. This, this marble I've already hit with it. You can see the difference between the high surface of the copper and the patina that's in the deep spots. When I first did that. Oh, wow. That looks great. Thank you. And you've got that thin band around there to kind of just lock uh -huh. in place. There you go. Like, I didn't put that thin band in this position because I thought it would look cool cutting across this window and stuff. It was structural. Like the, the idea behind the design on this specific marble, and I'll just show you the patina and the copper. I, I just really want to hold on to it and just show real quick. Um, so you're saying you buff that top layer? I buff the top layer. I'm gonna buff it again in a second and see if I can get more shine out of it. But that contrast wasn't there at first. It was all just as dark as the deep sides. Sure. Do you get a good look? I wanna make like knife blade handles. Yeah, knife blade handles are great. I did, there's like, the Z Zach Jorgensen did a, a really cool knife blade and I got to do the handles on it and they're just so fantastic. Okay. So that's what the buff pad is all about. Now, you noticed that, so my thought process on designing this piece was, first of all, I just made the marble. And then after I made the marble, I really liked what was going on. It was so cavernous. I was like, I wanna work with that. I wanna wor work with the optics on that. And I know that I put what they, what they call purview is it's just a, a lapped down flat spot. So with a vortex marble, you guys know that a, a clear orb, it magnifies. So, oh, it looks really deep. It's a vortex marble because it's magnifying. Well, then as soon as you put a flat lap on it, it strips that away. So it makes everything appear smaller. So for a while I was goofing with those two design elements. And then what I've been just starting to do is do like a, a concave type thing. And what that does is it actually shrinks things down. So my process with designing all of this was I looked at it and I thought, first of all, my favorite view is what I call the purview, which is just the lapped. I, I, I just think the scale of it is really impressive. So I looked at where this, the um, opal was blinging the most naturally. I'm like, right there is where the opal looks the best. So that dictated where I'm gonna put this flat lap spot. So I, then I thought, where's the biggest footprint where, cause I knew I wanted the, the magnified part to be the biggest footprint. So I'm like, where's the biggest spot where the opal is kind of bling and, and that dictated right there. And then with the leftovers, cause it's getting shrunk down anyways, I'm like, that's the sweet spot. And so that dictated those three spots. And then there was some leftover space and I knew I wanted to put copper on there. And anytime I can take copper and encroach on what would be the lens of the marble, it seems to give the whole thing like a sense of movement and motion. So I, I, I don't like to stay segregated to the front of the marble or the back of the marble. Like I spent too much time that way and as soon as I broke out of it, things got a lot funner. So then I knew I wanted to do this sort of like X sort of thing and I don't know why, so I did it. So I took over that. But then I was looking at that X and I was like, it's not long enough. Like it could have probably held on with this extra band going around it. But I'm just like, it, it just, it was a risk and I didn't want, want to take it. And so I'm like, you know, I'll take the risk of having this go out here in dead end. Well, it really helps to have this little triangle of clear glass still there too, because that's like a foothold, you know? And when I was blasting, I was sure to kind of give it some undercuts. But to make everything much more safe and secure, I decided to connect this band from this side to this side. I did try other angles and I didn't like it. it there, there was, I, I had, it was just the least invasive spot. So I, I had to do it, so I did it. And then, uh, but it, it works in the design nicely and you know, it, it's, 
it is what it is, you know? That's, it's, it's those sort of like, the process of like, well, this has to be here, this has to be here, this has to be here, and I have to secure this somehow, and you find the grace for it. That's what brings, in my opinion, things to life. That's what makes it its individual self. So, um, so okay, I'm gonna hit this with this polishing pad real quick. And yeah, um, so you can see, it really even shines it up more, pretty instantly. Also, I'll add, we can see where the, the polishing pad is going off onto the frosted glass and leaving some residue. No big deal. Warm, soapy water and um, a toothbrush. I love the reuse of those old toothbrushes. So, but we can see even more contrast now and a shinier surface. So these buffing pads are great. All right. Not nearly as dramatic as when you do the first buff. You know, this, this marble I finished up about a month ago and it's been handled, so. Great contrast on that. Yeah, I, I mean, as soon as you. Yeah, the line really just stand out. So when I, when I first started um, electroforming, I was sort of, <laughs> It's kind of funny to think about now, like a uh, copper purist in a way of, I was like, I had already sort of tapped into that idea that if I reuse copper from this old historical house and then say, you know, this is reused from this historical place. And so th this is like, this carries on the story of that and all this. I also thought of the patina like that. I was like, I used to finish a marble, wire brush it, get as shiny as possible. And then that was it. And that's how I sold them. And people would ask me like, don't you patina your work? And I'd say, no. And I said, why? Because the patina tells the story of the travels of the artifact. Like if a collector buys a piece and it's shiny as a penny and they go home and put it in their display case, it's gonna be pretty shiny still a year later. But if you take that thing to your family gathering and they just ate a bunch of chicken and they are passing it around and then it's out in the sun and all this, that thing is gonna turn crazy colors. And Oh, the patina tells the story of the travels of the artifact. And people like w thought that was interesting and cool and it, it's like true on some level. But boy, when you're doing like art that should be visually stunning and the first, when I started patinaing and I was like, dude, I was so off point that whole time, you know? It was like so much better in my opinion. So I can see that went down to zero volts and it's like chilling there. That's telling me that copper is accumulating. It's really funny to tell people, like it says zero, zero, like people were like, what do you mean set it at zero, you know? But I'm telling you. Oh, something I didn't explain earlier that I should, and I don't completely understand this, but for these power supplies, it's, uh, there's, there's two different modes and it's like one mode is it's a curvy wave and the other mode it's like a square wave. and. I believe the difference is, is when you have the volts cranked all the way, like I do, it puts it into a, what I think they call a constant current mode. So it's more like how you set it, it's gonna be constant versus like if you were running a little motor based on the load of the motor, is it gonna draw more energy and all of this? Like this just tells it like, it puts it in constant current mode and that's what you wanna do with your, with your power supply. So. Anyways, now I'm gonna just turn these amps up a little bit. I'm gonna just say that's pretty cool right there. It's like, I'm at least up to 0.01 amps. Chances are within the next hour, that's gonna drop back down to 0, 0.0 volts. And then that's gonna tell me that I can move these amps up just a little bit more. Now, once the, uh, quite a bit more copper accumulates, maybe not tonight, maybe by midday tomorrow, you're gonna see that this is probably gonna get up to like 0.04, you know? I'm gonna turn it up until, like I'm, for, for newer solution, I'm going to wait for it to bounce from 0.1 down to zero, then I'm gonna turn it up. And I'm gonna keep doing that as it accumulates. As the copper gets thicker and I'm more aggressive, if it stays on 0.1, my next indicator is never, ever, ever let it get up to 0.2. 0.2 is always too aggressive. That's what I have learned. So if I cannot get this thing to function without that thing bouncing up to 0.2 volts, 
the lower one, something's wrong. Like my solution needs to be filtered. So, something is off, a connection isn't happening. Um, okay, so with that being said, and that does happen, uh, and it's an indicator for me that my solution is getting dirty, I don't wait for that to happen to tell me to filter my solution. I filter my solution like after every three marbles. It's so, just the way I do it. If I had been really aggressive about the power I was using and I was getting that phosphorus sludge buildup and it was flaking off and I can see little black flakes down there, I'll, I'll take a little more care of my filtration um, with, then with newer solutions. So the way I filter my solution, very simple. What I do is I take the bottle that came in, the party next door. I use coffee filters, so I'll use two coffee filters. Now, if it's newer solution, I do not use these graphite pellets. These graphite pellets are like for aquariums and stuff. They're cheap, I buy them in big, big containers. Um, so one of the, uh, it's not the technical term, but one of the, the, the parts of this solution is it has brightener in it. The, what the brightener does is it, 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 it lets it just accumulate much quicker and easier, but it also gives you the capacity to have it look bright and shiny like a brand new penny when it comes out of the bath. That's not what I, I, I could care less about it being bright and shiny when it comes out because I, I wire brush it anyways and then it's bright and shiny. But, um, if it's coming out and it's looking dull and your, um, your powers are running funky, that's telling you that it might be time to add some brightener so you can buy brightener. And when I do my filtration, that's when I would add my brightener. If you do not use the carbon, it's, it, it's the same as graphite, it's carbon. It's, it's, I think it says graphite right on it too, but it's carbon pellets. Like for, this is specifically charcoal, yeah. This is um, like the kind for turtle tanks or whatever. So, um, pet smart, you know. Uh, what's that? Totally, lasts forever. Um, if, if I use this, it is going to actually take the brightener, it's, it's, it's gonna take all the contaminants out, but along with it, it's gonna take the brightener element out of it. So if you use the carbon when you filter it, you need to add brightener in there. If there's just particles of the phosphorus and all of that, and, um, but you think it's still got a lot of juice left in there, it's not necessary to use this. You can just use filters. Does that make sense? So that would just get the particle, like like the chunks out. But this is going to get the this is going to get the chunks out, and this is going to get like the impurities out. Um, it's going to be really expensive if every time you use this and then supplement it with the brightener because the brightener costs a little bit. So like I said, I, I wait till like every three marbles, and then what I'll do is I'll put a coffee filter in, and you got to kind of manipulate it a little bit. I, I use a straw because like, you know, it will, otherwise it will create a vacuum and it needs to get a little air in there. And so like, if I'm gonna use this, I put about the equivalent of a tablespoon, it's like a pinch, you know, just, you know, 30 pellets, put them in there. And then I will grab my bath and I will pour it in there. I have like four funnels, I'll do four, I batch, you know, I've got a lot of solution and if I, uh, once I feel like this needs to be filtered, I'll put the lid on it and I put it off to the side and I start another one. And then once I have like four of them sitting there, I'll be like, okay, time to filter. And I set up and I'll just pour them in. Also what's happening, you know, after, if I've done three marbles and I've ran each of the three marbles for three days, it's nine days it's been setting out, it's on a heating pad, water is evaporating out as well. So when I filter my solution, I'll fill up the bottle, but I'll only fill it up to say like about here. And then I will take this up regardless if I use these or not. I don't fill this up all the way. And then I, I top it off with distilled water. So it's important to use distilled water because there's no like impurities in there. And so I, I replenish the water a little bit. Just kind of got a guess on how much. Um, but, but like I said, I usually go about there. If I did use some of these, then I'll do the same, I'll fill it up to about there, and then I will 
you know, squirt like the equivalent of like two of these of the the squirter thing, you know. I don't think that's the technical term, but syringe dropper, like two droppers full or whatever. And this is where you're like, that doesn't sound very scientific, but you know, the people who do electroforming like legit lab style, it is a science, like to figure out how to keep your solution truly balanced and fresh. Like they are, it's very, very complicated stuff, you know? So um, I kind of do it the, the easy cheesy way and uh, that's, that's the way I've learned it. So then I, um, you know, remove this. I will usually, usually with, I use two of the coffee filters. Usually I can do two, filter two of these bottles per these filters and then you'll see it'll go really, really slow. So I switch out the filters. Then, um, you know, replace the cap. And if it's gonna set around for a while, I like to put a piece of tape around the cap. They, they, their older caps were only half as, as deep or whatever, so I was able to get a good connection with that tape, with the electrical tape, to, to get a more airtight seal. Um, but that helps prolong the life of that as well. So, questions? What's the stand made out of? That's on. It's acrylic. It's a, a polyurethane. Yeah, it's a polyurethane plastic. Um, Could you make, there you go. Could you make something out of like glass, like a little? Cut you could. Um, I would be concerned about scratching glass on glass. Um, I will also say um, to epoxy plastic to plastic, it can be complicated because bonding plastics is, you know, a tricky deal. So I used a two-part epoxy and before I did it, I took a razor knife and I did some cross hatching on the Tupperware to give a, a surface to grab to. And then also I did the same on the bottom of the marble stand. So it wasn't like two sort of like glossy surfaces trying to epoxy them together. Cause I have had them pop off before. And then I learned like, okay, put, put a lot of surface texture on there before epoxying them. And then I'll, I'll you know, mix the two part epoxy and I'll be I'm pretty heavy handed with it, put a lot on there and then I'll, I'll weight it down really good and, and you know, like put a big marble on there and let it set and uh, yeah. Um, you can get real creative about it. When I did the Zach Jorgensen blade and the blade had to sit in there on its side, I used wire basically like out of here, but I left the, the coating on it and I just bent nice little shapes so it sat in there really nice and then I used electric tape and I taped those down really good onto the bottom of the bath and it made it to where I could put it in there and it locked it down really well and that worked great and it also allowed me to flip the knife if I needed it to and so there's a, a lot of it is in the the preparation to, of what you're doing to get it to set in your bath well get that wire to touch down nice without things shifting. Can I say That's brilliant, uh, by the way, and I've not heard about titanium in rod form like that, and I will more, most likely go to that method. And what he's referring to, too, is that like, if you went into a more industrial place where they do electroforming, what you're gonna find is these big baths, and they're gonna have these, these uh, titanium uh, baskets, anode baskets on the side with holes, and then they're, they're anodes, they're gonna buy them in big bags, and they're like little pellets and stuff, and they're gonna fill those anode baskets on the sides, and that's how they're gonna do it because the titanium runs the current, you know? So yeah, it's some titanium uh, wire. It sounds brilliant and it won't deteriorate so you can just keep using them and using them. And also, the little uh, 
Blue Handle, Joe Ray, Snippers, uh, Wish, a dollar, buy as much as you want, buck or two. Cool. Cheap on there. They're like six, seven in a hardware store. Right. Right. Yeah, and these are like, you know, it's like somebody trying to nip your, you know, silver coin with your, you know, Carlo Donna shears or something. You're like, yo! And that's, that's or my wife's fabric scissors. Like, you know, if she sees me grab those, she's like, what are you cutting with those? I'm like, fabric, nothing else, I swear. Because I do the zippers. And so the zippers that I do are, they're zippers, they're real zippers. I use plastic zippers and I trim the fabric on the edges. So I've learned that fabric scissors are amazing for fabric. Do you ever do any silver plating? I do not do silver plating. Um, I was interested because what a lot of people do is they'll use copper to get the mass in the structure because it's cheap and it's easy, it's affordable, um, I should say inexpensive. Um, but then the, the precious metals, silver and gold, it's like not only you use different solution for it that's made specifically for it, you'd have to have the gold or silver you know, anodes. And then I'm not sure if you, I, I think that the copper itself is already conductive enough that you don't have to like paint it with a conductive paint or anything. And it's more of a dipping, right? But I think that the actual solution you use has a lot gnarlier like cyanide and all this stuff. So you have to be much more careful about exposing yourself to it. So you need a little more ventilation, a little more safety protocol. Um, I believe it's more hazardous materials environmentally as well. I'll also let you guys know, environmental wise, you know, you don't want this stuff in the environment. Like you're not wanting to rinse these things out like necessarily in your sink, you know? And so what a standard is, is I think they call it like a back out bath. And what it is, is you have a series. So you would have like four to five Tupperware containers and they'd be filled with distilled water. And you would pull the marble out and you dip it in the first bath, rinse, dip it in the second bath, rinse, dip it in the third bath, rinse. And so you, and you'll see like this one gets really dirty less and less. You know, and once by the time you back it out, like from three, then you can like go to the faucet because you don't see anything else happening. Then what it is, is you just kind of leave those alone because they'll evaporate off. And then you will keep like putting distilled water in there. And, you know, um, it's the way that a lot of people do it. Ultimately, when you, it's like paint or something, um, how they now a lot of times, like uh, if you have cans of paint that you need to get rid of, you'd pop the lids, you let them dry out completely, and then you take them to like the, the people and say, I need to dispose of this properly. The water will evaporate out and you'll be left with blue crystals. So. Any other questions? <laughs> well, when I watched like Breaking Bad, you know, those blue crystals looked very pure, you know, it looked like the moneymaker. But in those blue crystals, by the way, when they get on your skin, it's like paint remover or something. If you ever got that on your skin, it like you think an ant is biting you. You're like, what the fuck? And you're like, oh, a blue crystal is stuck to me. Like a little acid thing. So, yeah. You're, you're so specific with that cut of the wire that's connected to it. That new point of contact that you're making, how far off is it from that old point of contact? It wasn't a dramatic angle, you know? And so like, what I will say is that if it's a, if it's a sharp point on that wire and the point of contact is really small, it's very, it's way less than ideal. Like it, it, for some reason, it seems like it doesn't conduct as well, but it also can be prone to like scratching your glass. So I, I did something that was like not super, super sharp. It's not exact. It's really not. But what it will do is it will start to contour to the surface of the, if, if I'm not adjusting the marble and I'm just adjusting that wire from side to side, it's actually kind of the, the tip of that wire is actually starting to grow to contour the shape of the marble a little bit. But that wire, like how, if that was the point of contact, are you making new contact over here? Like right oh, I would say uh, like on this one, it's about a millimeter. A millimeter. A millimeter. I'm, I'm not going way off to the side, way off to the side, to the middle. I'm, I'm starting in the middle and I'm going off a millimeter over here. And then I'm like maybe going off a millimeter from center. So it'd be two, be two mils off this way and then one mil, you know. You don't hit that same point that you did before. Uh, I'll come back. I'll come back around to it. Okay. It gets less critical after, even by now. 
You know, like by now I can start to just lift up and put it down in the same spot. It's really like, I cannot stress enough the, yeah, and it's really like super critical in the first hour. After the first hour, it becomes much less critical. If, you know, this is a band, and so it's like, it's pretty, I don't know how the words to describe it. It's not as critical as if I was trying to do the whole back side of a marble and have that whole back of the side of the marble look really, really smooth like to a mere polish in the end or something. If that was the case, I would be much more like, well, in about an hour, I'm gonna rotate the marble, you know, 25 degrees or something, and then it, it hit it again, and in another hour, I'm gonna do another 25 degrees, and I'm gonna keep moving it, moving it, moving it the best I can to make it be no one point of contact for a really long time to hope it accumulates very evenly. But I, it's just not critical on this. It would be critical if I was more aggressive with my power too, and I thought it was really starting to develop any texture. So, yeah, I'm uh, like, Tomorrow, it's a crapshoot if I put it in with the same, I'm not, I'm not really paying attention to if the side that's facing upwards right now faces upwards tomorrow when I start it off. Uh, because for this design, it's not gonna make a difference. And then also, um, throughout the day tomorrow, I will not change the angle of it. Once I find a good spot where it's set and nice, I, I will move the wire a little bit, but I won't move the marble. Got to be more questions? No? How long have you been doing this? I started electroforming in 2011, I believe. It might have been 2010, but 2011 was the first time that I had a marble that I was like, oh man, I made a marble with some copper on it. So it's been a while. I really started to understand it um, much better, like say three years ago. And what made me understand it much better is when I started buying multiple power supplies and I realized that you could order three of these power supplies from the same company and then you can hook up one to this bath with this marble with this stuff exactly like this and turn it on and it will say one thing and then you can turn it off and switch these to the next machine and turn it on and it will say something completely different. And when I discovered, because I wanted to expand, and then when I discovered that, I was like, well, what the fuck? Like, how am I supposed to? And then I realized, like, um, there's too many variables to say rules about measure this, measure this, and then set it at this. And so it became all about watching the volt. Some of them you'll see, some of them have touchier knobs. Some of them it seems like you can turn that amp knob up really far before it starts to do anything. Sometimes you just barely touch it and it's fidgeting, you know? So every machine is different, every, but something that has been like totally true throughout, no matter what I switch around, is watching these volts and making it bounce between one and zero, never at two, and uh, if this thing is, uh, is letting me get over th the rule of the 0.10 amp per square inch, that it's requiring me to turn it up too high where I'm like, there's gotta be some other issue here. So it's like, clean, filter your solution, clean your bars. Like that's the thing is if like, if all of a sudden this was up to 0.25, but this wasn't even trying to bounce up yet and it was wanting me to turn it up even higher, I'd be like, Something is going on here with like the current making the full connection. So I would turn it all off. I would clean off those bars. I would filter my solution and then I would put it back in there. And or maybe like, you know, make sure where the banana clips are making contact, clean that up. And then I would turn it on and I would discover like, oh, it's back down again and not making me be that aggressive. And then so that was a big turning point when I put those pieces together and was like, oh, this is telling me when I need to clean my solution. You know, so. So y'all can like hunt me down throughout the week if you have, you know, discover you have questions or hit me up, you know, private message me on whatever, Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And uh, I'm pretty open with the information. So that's that. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, man. Yep.
Thank you. Thanks.